we know and love the real line and the rationals and irrationals that it contains. And we know how the rationals are all snuggled up in the real line. Every little interval around a rational number contains an irrational and vice versa. And we have a great way of organizing the real numbers. If we want to give a specific real number, we can give its decimal expansion, which is kind of like driving directions or a mailing address for that real number. Now you might say base 10 is a little bit of a historical or maybe anatomical accident. And that's true, we could change the base, but that's also a little bit arbitrary. And in fact, you're right. In fact, the real numbers actually know how they'd prefer to be organized, and it has nothing to do with bases. That's what I want to explain today, the right way to give a mailing address for every real number. Now, this, those have to do with continued fractions, if you've met those before, but you're not even going to recognize them. I'm going to give, um, the, I'm going to explain the real line as this rich geometric structure, and there's going to be tons of pictures. So let's go. If I reorganize the reals, I don't mean I'm going to reorder them. Two-thirds is still less than three-halves. What I mean is that I'm going to change the way I talk about them, like inventing a new system for naming or addressing them, kind of like changing from zip codes to GPS coordinates. To see what I mean, let's check out the decimal expansion, the most common way to organize the real line. Let's say I have a real number I really care about, like everyone's favorite, pi. I can specify where it is in the real line by giving its decimal expansion. 3.14159265358 and so on. By giving the decimal expansion, what I'm really doing is giving a series of rational numbers that are getting closer and closer to my number. 3 is the closest integer less than pi, then 3.1 is the closest tenth less than pi, then 3.14 is the closest hundredth, etc. People are famously obsessed with the digits of pi. Honestly, a few hundred digits is plenty. With an approximation that good, we can find the circumference of a sphere whose diameter stretches across the size of the observable universe to an accuracy within the Planck length, which is pretty much all you could ever need. But humans being humans, as of last year, we've now computed a hundred trillion digits. Giving a real number by a list of nearby rationals is a natural enough idea because we can give rational numbers exactly. If you think about it, the reals in general are much more slippery. You actually can't specify them exactly, unless you have a concrete defining property, like pi as a ratio of diameter to circumference, or the square root of two, which squares to two. Very few of the reals have a special property like this, just by a cardinality argument. There are only countably many special properties that can be described in finitely many English words, for example. So using a list of nearby rationals is a good idea but using rationals whose denominators are powers of 10 is pretty arbitrary. Among all the possible sequences of rational numbers that approach pi, what makes a particular sequence a good way to approximate pi? Aren't they all equally arbitrary? The clue here is 22 sevenths. It's nowhere in the approximations the decimal expansion gives, but it's a pretty remarkable approximation to pi. It comes within two one hundredths using only a denominator of seven. That's good enough to compute the circumference of a two meter wide circular dining table to the nearest centimeter. Think of rational approximations to pi as being a cost to benefit calculation. The cost is the size of the denominator. The benefit is the quality of the approximation. Then 22 sevenths is remarkable, and so is 355 over 113, which is accurate to six decimal places with a denominator of only three digits. The key is to forget the reals for a moment and go way back to the beginning, to rethink the rationals themselves. Let's follow their lead and organize them by their complexity. Let's put down the integers first, the simplest of all rational numbers. Let's make them nice and big so we don't lose track of them. Then let's put those with denominator two, a little smaller, then denominator three, and so on, and so on. we get a beautiful beaded necklace of rational numbers. Now I'm gonna pull a little trick. I'm gonna expand these little disks on the rational numbers. The radius is proportional to the inverse of the square of the denominator, so larger denominator means smaller disk, and I'm scaling up that constant of proportionality. I'm gonna stop when the radius is exactly one over the denominator squared. This picture has an amazing property, which is known as Dirichlet's theorem. The real line runs across the middle of the picture. Imagine the disks are open disks, so their boundaries are not there. Then the rationals are covered by their own disk and, says Dirichlet, only finitely many other smaller disks. 
And more amazing, Dirichlet says that every irrational number is covered by infinitely many disks. This gives us a way to visually feel the structure of the rationals and irrationals inside the real line. The irrationals are exactly the points under infinitely many disks, a sort of glowing limit in this picture. And it has another fascinating consequence, which is that for each irrational, nature has gifted us with a very special sequence of rational numbers. These are the centers of the infinitely many disks that cover that irrational. Take pi, for example. The sequence of disks covering pi is getting smaller and smaller, so the rational numbers at their centers are getting closer and closer to pi. What are these numbers? They're the rationals p over q, satisfying that the distance between p over q and pi is smaller than 1 over q squared. So these are good approximations. With only denominator q, we get to within 1 over q squared of pi. What's going on here? To understand, let's take a step even further back. What is a rational number, really? It's a ratio. One way to capture a ratio is as a slope, the ratio between horizontal and vertical motion. So a rational number is really a light ray shooting out of the origin in some direction. If I fill the plane with a lattice of points having integer coordinates, then the light ray corresponding to A over B will hit point A comma B of the lattice. Think of these finite rays, like a starburst out of the origin in the plane, as the rational numbers. By the way, I apologize that my slopes are really run over rise, not rise over run, but doing it upside down compared to the conventional choice will be helpful later. Since the origin is our point of reference, instead of floating above this lattice, let's descend into it. We are heading down to the origin, so we can sit at the origin looking out. What do we see? Our lines of sight are like the rays from the origin heading out and hitting the elements of the lattice. Now we're entering the lattice point at the origin, settling down into our final position. We see exactly the beaded necklace of rational numbers. The rational numbers are not really one-dimensional as we usually imagine them. They're two-dimensional and we're seeing them as trapped in a one-dimensional real line. This, by the way, is called projective geometry. The rationals with smaller numerator and denominator are those lattice points of the integer lattice which are closer to our eye as we stand at the origin and look around. Let's look at a schematic of what we just saw. Here's the lattice in the upper right quadrant. We are standing at the origin, looking out. At the left, the view from above. At right, the view from the origin. Here, for example, is the rational zero, also known as zero comma one. On the right, I'll put a big dot for this very simple rational number. Here's one one, also known as the integer one. I'm gonna decorate the picture at the right a little bit by adding an arc connecting the first two simplest rational numbers here. I'm just using this to keep track of what order I've been adding in my rationals. Now here is one comma two, also known as one half, and the next simplest rational number in between zero and one. I'll add arcs inside my original arc to show how we're essentially subdividing the first interval into two subintervals. So how are we organizing our lattice of integers? By vector addition. Notice that one half is exactly the vector sum of zero and one. That is, between a over b and c over d, I'm going to take the vector sum, a plus c over b plus d. For example, between a half and one, I get two thirds, and between zero and a half, I get one third. As I've mentioned, to track these recursive subdivisions, I use these bubbles. When I subdivide using the mediant, that's that special vector sum rational, I'll draw bubbles from the endpoints meeting at the new rational, creating two subbubbles. Let's just keep doing this forever. This is called the fairy subdivision of the real line. Compare it to the usual decimal subdivision, which would look like this. These are both ways to break the real line into intervals and then subintervals and so on forever. Thinking of the real line in this way as a projection of a two-dimensional space. Now what is pi? It's also a slope but an irrational one, heading out through the integer lattice but never touching the lattice points. 
The really good approximations are the points that are near misses. Here comes 22 sevenths, which is really amazing. If we think of the same process in our frothy bubble picture, we could drop a blue vertical line down from infinity through the frothy bubbles to hit pi. As we descend, we pierce the bubbles. This process gives us a kind of device for keeping track of which rational numbers we are passing between. Now we can give pi a new kind of address in the real line. Imagine we're traveling downward from above, heading to pi along that vertical blue line. We pass through the fairy foam, entering bubble after bubble, each bubble has two sub-bubbles. We choose one of these and indicate it as right or left, like driving directions. We can record this as L's and R's for each region we pass through. If the region squeezes down to a point on the right side of the blue pie line, that means we're entering the right sub-bubble of the bubble that we're in. So we write R for right, and a similar story for the left. So we write L, L, R, 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 and so on and so forth. If we collect these together, we get the sort of driving directions for pi. So a little note here, we start with three because we started our line down to pi in the third unit interval. And after that, we use the method I described. So if we keep going, as we'll do in a moment, the sort of fairy expansion for pi starts three, seven, 15, one, 292, one, and so on. It turns out that this is just the same as the usual continued fraction expansion, if you've heard of that. The continued fraction is written in this crazy way made out of a, the same list of numbers that we have above. In this visualization, I've colored the bubbles that the pi line crosses in red. These end at certain rational numbers. The ones where a cluster of them end are special, like 22 sevenths. These are the good approximations to pi, and maybe you can see how if pi is very close, the cluster will have more and more lines. So 22 sevenths has a cluster of 16 lines, giving 15 R's in the expansion. 15 is a pretty big number, so it's a pretty good approximation. But keep watching. You'll see an incredible clump coming up soon. There it is, at 355 over 113. There are 293 lines in this clump. And so 355 over 113 is an incredible approximation to pi, as we saw before. What I've described to you is the continued fraction expansion of pi. This visual reimagining of it is due to Carolyn's series, and you can find a link to a beautiful paper of hers in the description below. Now, to give an address to pi, we just give the continued fraction expansion. 3, 7, 15, 1, 292, 1, and so on which in turn gives a list of rational numbers approaching pi. But not just an arbitrary list of numbers, a very special list of numbers. So this is pi's true nature, at least with reference to the rational numbers. One amazing thing about the continued fraction expansion of pi is that it has a few really big coefficients early on, especially that 292, which means that 355 over 113 is such a great approximation. We don't know of any special pattern of any kind that shows up in the continued fraction expansion of pi. Why does it have this amazing 292 early on? No idea. The continued fraction expansion continues in a bit less exciting way after that. One final note as we watch the continued fraction expansion zoom in. These arcs I've added in are actually hyperbolic geodesics in the upper half complex plane, and the hyperbolic geometry that naturally occurs there has a lot to say about continued fractions. But that's a story for another time. Finally, I'll end by placing the Dirichlet's theorem image over the fairy subdivision. These are two different, but of course very related, ways to see essentially the same collection of good approximations to pi. Visualizations have a power of their own, so I'll leave you with this image and you can let it tell you how to tie these two ends together. So there you have it. That's the true story of continued fractions and the way that the reals really want to be organized. Now, we'll probably stick with the decimal system. It's a lot easier to add and multiply with the decimals, and we probably don't want to be designing parts for future flying cars and jetpacks using continued fractions. But it's beautiful mathematics. A lot of what I told you about today I learned from the works of Carolyn series, and I'll put a link in the description below to one of her beautiful articles.